Good evening, everyone. As the director of Goethe Institute Max Miller Baban Mumbai, I'm having the great pleasure of welcoming everyone present here, as well as our virtual audiences, to our second literary intervention in the framework of State of Nature. State of Nature, which the name suggests, is based on ecology and climate change and ventures in its current third iteration since 2018 into multidisciplinary culture production and its associated conversations. I would also like to mention the related exhibition titled New Natures, A Terrible Beauty is Born is on view in our gallery and the natural history section and lawns of the CSMBS till mid-April. It includes the works of 17 young and senior contemporary artists dealing with ecology from different perspectives. The exhibition is curated by Ravi Agarwal and the literary interventions by our curator of literature, Ranjit Hoskote. Today's lecture is by Forrest Gander, a writer and translator with degrees in geology and literature. He was awarded the Pulitzer Prize, the Best Translated Book Award, and fellowships from the Guggenheim, Whiting, and United States Artists Foundation. He has most recently published Twice Alive in Ecology of Intimacies. Gander, who taught at Harvard and Brown University, translates books by poets from Spain, Latin America, and Japan. He is married to the artist Ashwini Bhatt. Dear Forrest, I'm happy to have you with us tonight in person. The physical and the virtual floor are yours now. I wish all of you an enjoyable and inspiring evening. Thank you. Thank you, Bjorn. So I'd like to thank Bjorn and Amruta of the Goethe Institute and Ravi and Ranjit for their inspiring respective works as artists and for their collaborative visionary curatorial work which is featured in this gallery. And my, my new friend uh, Niha Choksi who today taught me the Jain concept of Anikantaveda. <clears throat> I'm going to uh, talk a little bit, um, maybe just five minutes, and then <clears throat> read some poems and show some films, and then there'll be a conversation um, between uh, Ranjit and I, between Ranjit and me. Here, in the second decade of the 21st century, we find ourselves better prepared to navigate through a world of different voices and dialects. But we're aware that the language practices commandeering history are increasingly standardized, utilitarian, and transcriptional. We're already experts at navigating sound bites. We absorb cliches and ready-made phrases in newspapers, on television, in gossip and casual conversation with text messaging, emojis, grammar, and spell check programs, were offered in the middle of making a word or sentence a range of choices for completing it. Those choices are programmed to the most likely possibilities among conventions. The full range is shoehorned into high probability solutions. These shortcuts are useful, of course, but they nudge us toward predetermined expressions, presumptive ruts that circumscribe thinking and condition perception. As globalization draws us together and industrialization and human population pressures take their toll on natural habitats, as species of plants and animals flicker and are snuffed from the earth, it may be worthwhile to ask whether an ethnocentric view of human beings as a species independent from others underpins our exploitation of natural resources and sets into motion dire consequences. What we've perpetrated on our environment has affected a poet's means and material, but can 
poetry be ecological? Can it display or be invested with values that acknowledge the economy of interrelationship between human and non-human realms? Aside from issues of theme and reference, how might syntax, line break, perspective stance, or the shape of the poem on a page express an eth ecological ethics? If our perceptual experience is mostly palimpsestic or endlessly juxtaposed and fragmented, if events rarely have discrete beginnings or endings, but only layers, duration, and transitions. You remember Janis Joplin in a live recording of Ball and Chain saying, <clears throat> it's all the same fucking day, man, after staying up all night, realizing that there is no real separation. If natural processes are already altered by and responsive to human observation, how does poetry register the complex interdependency that draws us into a dialogue with the world. There are, of course, long traditions of the pastoral, poetry centered on nature or landscape in both Eastern and Western language literatures. I myself am less interested in nature poetry when nature features simply as a theme than in poetry sometimes called eco-poetry, which investigates both thematically and formally the relationship between nature and culture, language and perception. My dear late friend, the Kashmiri poet Aga Shahid Ali, used to make fun of the kind of poetry in which nature is regarded as an object of contemplation. He knew that what defines an object is our separation from it. He used to say that nature poetry of the popular American poet Mary Oliver usually went about like this. <clears throat> I walk outside, I see a flower, I have an orgasm of delight, and I come inside and write about it. In this kind of poetry, nature is forever outside of us, whereas in actuality, we are never separate from nature. In fact, at this precise moment, helminth parasites are swimming around this woman's intestines and bioflora in your digestive tract are helping you break down that lunch we had. In the warmth behind our knees and in the crooks of our arms, millions of bacteria are stewing. Even at the very deepest level, our DNA includes the DNA of other organisms that long ago became incorporated into our system. Racists talk about blood purity and racial purity, but we are all mongrels, and race itself is an invented concept. There is no biological definition of race. None of us is pure, not even purely human. We are a community of relationships. As most of you know here in this room, between 300 BCE and 300 CE, some 2,000 years ago, there was a blossoming of literature in southern India that came to be called Sangam, or Convergence. One of the two styles of that literature is Akam, a poetry in which personal emotions, the nuances of love, are linked with landscape in such a way that human feeling is expressed as inseparable from the place where that feeling occurs. The remarkable intellectual N. Manu Chakravarti generously wrote an essay included in my book, Twice Alive, in which he introduces Sangam to an American audience. Other contemporary scholars of Sangam now argue that the boundaries between inner Akam and outer Puram landscapes are far more porous than scholars previously assumed, and that the ultimate goal of Sangam poetry and poetics is the dissolution of any split between self and landscape. 
As you all here are aware, A.K. Ramunajan translated and reintroduced much of that poetry, which we might consider now a kind of proto-eco-literature, a phenomenological poetics in which human subjectivity merges with the world. Sangam seems to me to be a corpus that has a great deal to contribute to our considerations of the ecological crisis of our own time. And I wanted to call attention to this body of work in America, where it is too little known. Since the five basic landscapes that appear in Sangam poetries happen to be the same five basic landscapes common to California, where I live, I wrote poems loosely inspired by Sangam poetics, but located in California. <clears throat> Finally, I want to say this about the poems I'm about to read. I'm hoping you can be involved with the poetry without feeling an obligation to make immediate sense of it. Part of my strategy as a poet is to draw the reader outside the limits of familiar expression, easily agreed upon values, or neatly summarized meanings. I want the reader to experience meaning as an active collaboration of world and attentiveness. I'm given to draw on counterpointed streams of language types, scientific, descriptive, and emotive. It's my belief that poetry doesn't simply supplement the rational intellect, but provides an inherently and sometimes incommensurable form of insight. Because its meanings are neither quantitative nor verifiable, poetry may offer different, subtler, and more complex expressions than the language of information and commerce. So let's cue up the first uh, film. Circumambulation of Mount Tamalpais. Maculas of light fallen weightless from pores in the canopy. Our senses part of the wheeling life around us. And through an undergrowth stoked with the unseen go the reverberations of our steps. As we hike upward, mist holds the butterscotch taste of Jeffrey Pine to the air until we reach a serpentine barren, red bud, lilac, and open sky, a crust of frost on low-lying clumps of manzanita. At Redwood Creek, two tandem runners cross a wooden bridge over the stream ahead of us, the raspy check-check-check of a scrub jay. Hewing to the dipsia path while a plain's slow groan diminishes bayward, my sweat-wet shirt going cool around my torso as another runner goes by, his cocked arms held too high. Cardiac Hill's granite boulders appear freshly sheared. Look, you say, I can see the Farallon Islands there, to the south, over those long-backed hills. One behind another, a crow honks. The moon still up over Douglas firs on the climb to Rock Spring. Yellow jackets and painted lady butterflies settle on the path where some underground trickle moistens the soil. I predict you'll keep to the shade of the laurels to nibble your three anchovy slices over cheese sandwich while I sprawl on a boulder in full sun sucking a pear. The frass of caterpillars tinkles onto beds of dry leaves under the oaks where a hawk alights with its retinue of raging crows. We are prey to the ache of not knowing what will be revealed as the world lunges forward to introduce itself. Dots, bitter oyster, line the black stick held in your hand. Weak trees leaning into us as if we were part of the wet dark that sustains their roots under dead leaves and at armillaria. Since honey mushrooms suck from the soil chemicals that trigger a tree's defenses, they leach the tree's sap 
undetected, all the while secreting toxins to stave off competing species. But in the inseparable genetic mosaic of their thin root filaments, the identity of any singular species blurs among interactive populations, twice alive. Near the summit, a gleaming slick-and-sides outcrop sanctifies the path, winding through a precinct of green schists whose lethal minerals sterilize the ground. The hum of some large insect immelmanning around our heads calls to mind, you tell me, the low drone of a Buddhist chant. But now we hear, really hear chanting we can't decode. Don't be so rational, a congregate speech from red trembling sprigs, a vascular language prior to our breathed language, corporeal, chemical, drawing our sound into its harmonic, tuning us to what we've not yet seen, the surround calling us, theoryless, towards an inference of horizontal connections, there at ground level, an incantation independent of us but detectable, consummate, always resistant to us, but inciting our recognition of what it might mean to be here among others, human and not. Here, home, where ours is another of the small voices taking over, over ourselves, over into the nothing between, the out of sight of ourselves, a litany of spore-bearing mouths as Hi-fi stretch their long necks and open their throats, opening a link between systems, a super-saturation of syntax, an arousal even as slow, rolling walls of high-decibel sonar blow out the ears of whales, and fires burn uncontrolled, and slurry pits leak into the creek, etc., etc., femicides, war, righteous insistence and still and still the lived sensation fits into the living sensorium can't you hear don't be so rational the world inhale hear the call from elsewhere which is just where we are no even closer inside us inside the blood pulse of our bodies the bristles of our mosses the embrace and exhale So my book, Twice Alive, uh, begins with a note to the reader, which I think I'll share with you before I read another poem. Um, what many of us, you listening and um, you here, uh, learned in high school about lichen, usually that it's an indicator species for pollution. Litmus, uh, litmus in fact, is derived from lichen and that it's the synergistic alliance of a fungus and an algae or cyanobacteria is pretty much true but simplified. Like an ecology seems to have more to do with collaboration than competition, and collaboration is transformative. With lichen, which may be more related to animals than plants, some scientists say, the original organisms are changed utterly in their compact with each other. They can't return to what they were. And according to Anne Pringle, one of the leading contemporary mycologists with whom I had the lucky opportunity to collaborate, it may be that lichen do not, given sufficient nutrients, age. Anne and other contemporary biologists are saying that our sense of the inevitability of death may be determined by our mammalian orientation. Perhaps some forms of life have theoretical immortality. The thought that two things, the thought of two things that merge, mutually altering each other, two things that intermingled and interactive become one thing that does not age, brings me to think of the nature of intimacy. Isn't it often in our most intimate relations that we come to realize that our identity, all identity, is combinatory? Forest. A 
erogenous zones in oaks, slung with stoles of lace like, and the sun's rays spilling through leaves in broken packets. A force, call it nighttime, thrusts mushrooms up from their lair of spawn, mycelial loam, the whiff of port. They pop up into untrammeled air with a sort of gasp that follows a fine chess move. Like memories, are they? Or punctuation? Was it something the earth said to provoke our response, tasking us to recall an evolutionary course, our long ago initiation into the one among others? And within my newborn noticing, have you popped up beside me, love? Or were you here from the start, a swarm of meaning and decay still gripping the underworld? Both of us, half buried, holding fast, if briefly, to a swelling vastness, while our coupling begins to register in the already awake compendium that offers to take us in. You take me in, and abundance floods us floats us out. We fill each with the other. All morning breaks as birdsong over us who rise to the surface so our faces might be sprung. Um, forest is one of the five landscapes that come up in Sangam poetry. Another is uh, wasteland. Uh, I understand that someone else may have written a poem with that title. <clears throat> My title is Wasteland for Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa is the town next to the town that I moved to when I moved back to California. And the year that I moved there, uh, wildfires uh, started in part because of uh, an intense drought, because of um, the heating planet. Uh, burned the town down, and two years later, burned the town again. This, this poem is Wasteland for Santa Rosa. Green spring grass on the hills had cured by June, and by July, gone woolly and brown, it crackled underfoot, desiccated, while within the clamor of live oaks, an infestation of tiny larvae clung to the underleaves, feeding between veins. Their frass, that fine dandruff of excrement and boring dust, tinkled as it dropped onto dead leaves below the limbs. You could hear it twenty feet away, tinkling. Across the valley, on Sugarloaf Ridge, the full moon showed up, like a girl doing cartwheels. No one goes on living the life that isn't there. Below a vast column of smoke, heat, flame, and wind, I rose, swaying and tottering on my erratic vortex, extemporizing my own extreme weather, sucking up acres of scorched topsoil, and spinning it outward in a burning sleet of filth and embers that catapulted me forward with my mouth open in every direction at once. So I came for you, turning, turning the present into purgatory, because I need to turn everything to tragedy before I can see it, because it must be leavened with remorse for the feeling to rise. That was the wasteland. Um, uh, the other landscape, another landscape that comes up in the Sangam poems is the sea. And I'm thinking, because I'm married to an immigrant, uh, Ashwini Bhatt from uh, southern India, uh, very much of immigration these days. This is, of course, the time of the greatest human migrations across any kinds of borders in all of our history. 
and thinking also about the sea as a constant immigrant to the shore. Immigrant sea, aroused by her inaccessibility, he aches for more of her life to live inside him, watching the breakers, standing so close he can feel heat coming off her wet scalp. What is his relation to this person before him, so familiar and foreign? The way he searches out her face, he searches out himself. Gusts thrash crests of swell, spring grasses twirl circles in the sand where they stand without speaking. She wants him to know it's all charged, even grass positive, pollen negative. So when grass waves, it sweeps the air for pollen. He feels electricity all around, as though the wild drama of the coming storm were already aware of them, foreigners on this shore. Little sapphire blue flowers speckle the dunes. He wonders if he has let himself flatten out into a depthless sheet, like escalator stairs, whether in the end he'll disappear underground without the smallest lurch of resistance. But when her lavish face turns toward him, beaming, the corners of her eyes wind wet, he yields to that excess, he reappears to himself. And um, let's, um, let's play that movie called Moving Around for the Light. Let me talk, before we start it, let me tell you a little bit about this. This is a collaboration with a photographer named Lucas Folia and, uh, and a musician named Brady Earnhardt. And um, it's, uh, it's developed uh, after, uh, based on lots of interviews with people in the United States living in what used to be called utopian communities, and now the preferred terminology is intentional communities. Some of these people um, live completely off the grid and eat only uh, roadkill and veg and fruit and things that they find in the forest. Some, um, some are uh, there because of religious practices. Uh, some are there just because they want as many guns as they can have uh, illegally. And, um, and it's, it is an American phenomenon, these, um, the sense of an independence from the rest of a culture and society. These, this poem is developed from their words. It's called Moving Around for the Light, a Madrigal. Moving Around for the Light, a Madrigal. The natural order of things, sugar bushing, some things we do would gross people out because they just don't know. Always was baffled by the connections in life. It's moving around for the light. I thought, that plant's growing before my eyes. It's insane. What the news media don't want you to know. All the wild edible plants, for instance. We're getting on good here, blacks and white. No fossil fuel-based technology. I've eaten owl, wing muscles and leg muscles. That's the only meat on him. So much roadkill, beavers, otters, deer, raccoon. We cook them up, preserve the hide instead of slashing it. Got it laid out real clear. A lot can be done with duct tape. A bucket of honey between May and August. Who controls oil controls the world. It's a lawyer's racket, but they don't go by law. That's the truth and people don't even know it. Want to find my bearings in what's real. Started an anarchist collective with 13 others, like myself, independent people. Mountains seem to draw folks who want to live in wilderness. The biggest problems come from being disconnected. I did really well in school, but I didn't like it. How do you sustain yourself day to day? 
Take five milk goats and a sack of sweet potatoes, a grist mill, a harness shop. Most people independent enough to live out here like this, they're too independent to listen to each other. Feed somebody lunch and they cut your wood all year. That works. Until the kids are grown, don't want to bring others in on account of influence. Some things we do would gross people out because they don't know. Where do you think you come by your pattern for your axe handle? Take your old axe handle and lay it on there. Nobody comes in, nobody leaves. We'll mind ourselves, let us alone. They wear people out so they say, I'll just pay the fine. That's the truth and people don't even know it. I was on her windshield, 20 or 30 feet, and then she hit the brakes and I flew into a telephone pole. Heard a lot of stories about people's lives. Who needs a house and how much tin? We're different, you can't treat us the same. Garlic, pumpkin, onion, squirrel, and they come here to learn to make sorghum. Those that have enough guts to live off the land, they're independent people like myself. But I lived in community, lived with the Amish. With them, woodcutting isn't cutting wood. Wood's a byproduct. That's why you can't use chainsaws. Can't talk to someone over a chainsaw. Want to move in a way that's more connected. See the cause and effect in my life. Right at the start of my senior year, a natural progression from activism and travel. How do you sustain yourself day to day? And they come to learn to make sorghum. What the news media don't want you to know. Those dogs, they're rabbit dogs. Like to lose that feeling of being a foreigner and find a sense of being at home. Out felling trees alone on a windy day. Took my eyes off it for three seconds. A big gust of wind came up and blew it down on me. My first thought was, oh shit, I don't have insurance. Which is a really funny thought considering. Let's get this process right. I'm not quitting unless I feel in my heart I'm going to quit. That's the difference between me and other people. Blue heron is good, tastes good. Ever eat a blue heron? Supervisor said, there's no common law in Virginia. We don't know how fast it's going to happen. Food's going to be number one, next is going to be ammo. We'll figure, we figure we'll end up feeding a lot of outsiders. Took my eye off it for three seconds. First thought was, oh shit, it's a right. It's always been a right. The difference between me and other people. We care for ourselves, let us alone. I've got it laid out real clear. Biggest problems come from being disconnected. Beavers, otters, deer, raccoon, I've eaten owl. Hard to feed yourself for a year. Milk goats are the most valuable thing you can have. Banks go down, people can't get money, they'll see what they need. Food's number one, and next is going to be ammo. If bad goes to worst, we'll post a man to keep out strangers working to get that other doctor to move here. Like in Vietnam, killing those women and kids, that's not the American mindset, but I think it might come to such. Tanning hides, fire without matches, when others won't, we'll make it. Take five milk goats and a sack of sweet potatoes. You can go anywhere. The natural order of things is when a species gets dominant over its niche. I'm always baffled by the connections. That plant's growing before my eyes. It's instantly felt comfortable here. Skinned my first raccoon, and it looked so much like a fetus, I cried. Don't know how fast it's going to happen, or if it'll happen. But if it doesn't happen, we're not hurting either way. Grew up using a bow and arrow to shoot rabbits. Need to be around like-minded people so I can see the cause and effect in my life. They're really strong personalities. I have a strong personality too. Nobody comes in, nobody leaves. Ever eat a blue heron? Natural order of things. Wing muscles and leg muscles, that's the only meat on him. Where do you think you come by your pattern? 
Let's get this process right. Want to find my bearings in what's real. Move in a way that's more connected. That's close to 40 minutes, five more minutes. Um, so I'll read the last poem. This is from Twice Alive. <clears throat> Unto ourselves, to see what's there and not already patterned by familiarity, for an unpredicted whole is there, casting a pair of shadows, manipulating its material, advancing, Assembling enough kinship that we call it life, our life, what is already many lives, the dimensions of its magnitude veiled to us as we live it. Across the cytoplasm of adjacent cells goes a signal that turns you toward me, turns me into you. We are coupled in quiet tumult, convergent arguments, an alien rhythm becoming familiar, a rhythm of, I am here, never to be peeled away. We are become one thing, listening for what's there and not. Through the storm, neem trees on the hills stamp wildly in their roots. We have passed through the spring, but what thing has passed through us? Now your laughter transparentizes me, and whose sense of the self doesn't swerve? Your unconditional foreignness grows conditional, stops being foreign at all. With your nearness, my lens on the world shifts. A peristaltic contraction courses through us as a single wave. No longer can we keep our distance, our lips brush, or the tips of ourselves. But what language are you whispering to me, your teeth stained by nilgiri tea, above the trills and whistles in the high limbs, above the screech of a bulldozer blade, shoving rubble up the wounded street, above the silence of an eyeless tick climbing a grass stem? I understand nothing but the lust your voice incites the declamatory tenderness. How and who can say what force has queued up this hour for our small voices to merge into a carnality that did not exist before now? Having come to this unforeseen conjunction, we slip into one another. We take hold in a pulse of heat, in a yes and no, for already we can see we are no longer what we were as I find you within me, not fused, not bonded, but nested. And for you, is it the same? The intensity of such investment, each of us excited by the volatility of the other, which propels us in a rush as something, perhaps our lips brush, or the tips of ourselves, stripping away what? What was before? Was there even anything before? The reconfiguration is instantaneous experience. It is being itself. But who's being now? Was I endowed with some special pliability so that becoming part of you, I didn't pass through my own nihilation? And what does the death of who you were mean to me now, except that you are present constantly? Because excess is what it took for us to transform to a fulge, you cast your life beyond itself. Can't you sense me with your ecstatic openness, like rain mingling with red earth? Without you, I survived, and with you, I live again in a radical augmentation of identity, because we have effaced our outer limits, because we summoned each other. In you, I cast my life beyond itself. Thank you. Stone from southern India. Faris, thank you so much. That was, on many levels, absolutely amazing. 
Uh, amazing also that you're here without benefit of time zones and things. It's really a very special privilege to have you read to us and, and discuss your ideas in person. So, but what, what a moment, you know, during a pandemic and now during a war. That's it's true. Just, yeah. So I was really struck. I mean, that's a passage that I've been reading and rereading for the last few days, actually. And it's amazing that you're closed with it. And I want to pick this phrase out of it, radical augmentation. And it seems to, to embrace so much that goes on in your work. As you were speaking, and uh, also as we were immersed in some aspect of the film, reading performance, it just struck me with great force that in all of your work, there's a microscopic attentiveness to processes of growth or decay. And at the same time, there's kind of an epic awareness of deep time and slow process, uh, a constant shifting of, um, of scale. Of, uh, of a role as well. Where is the voice coming from? Who's speaking? What is the perspective adopted? And then there's this other phrase that struck me with great force. You talk of a vascular language. So I want to begin at a kind of an angle, because uh, with, with some of this work that we saw today, it's almost as if you want to question the idea of a sort of a specialized recipient of aesthetic experience not just the reader or the viewer or the listener. So could we begin by talking about these experiments that you've been involved in? Working across film, reading, the live moment of performance. Sure. I'm interested in the whole hog of, of, um, of art, um, not just the pork loin, or um, uh, and um, so, although I think that poetry, one of the reasons there was a recent poll in the United States about the state of poetry, and it turns out there are more people reading it now in the United States than ever before. There's been a huge surge, almost a logarithmic surge, in the last ten years and largely among young people and, um, and people of color. And I think part of that is in, because we live in an age of spectacle um, and that we're constantly being bombarded um, by images. Um, and that's so entertaining and so hypnotic. Um, but there's something people are still looking for that isn't provided by just that mechanism. And so people are finding silence and there's the miracle that you can still sit in a room with just a book and um, words and a page and have an experience that's transcendent. And I'm very respectful of that power of just the naked word on the page. But I'm also interested in augmentation and in um, in uh, the other possibilities of uh, working with other arts and with working with language in different ways. Rimbaud said, um, are, you know, that new ideas always flow into new forms. And I want to be uh, alert to those. It speaks to your invocation of the lichen. Uh, two dissimilar things coming together and then producing a third thing that's a kind of an unpredictable result, a new kind of life form. So this is more of a biographical question. I want to pin that to your long-term uh, preoccupation with translation as a practice, as a key dimension of your work as a poet. So could you, could you take us on a journey on how that began for you? Why did you seek out work by colleagues in other languages, other literatures? Uh, yes, it, these are surprising questions. Interesting, I'm still going back to the first one and thinking about what you talked about with scale. And that's um, something that I think I developed um, by studying geology, where you're constantly looking or, or tacking between um, sort of microscopic 
microscopic crystalline structures under a microscope and then large scale um, uh, movements of uplift and mountain building and, um, and whatever. Um, with regard to lichen and translation, that's so interesting. Um, the, the thing that happens with lichen is that two, two actually more than two, a number of things conjoin and are translated into something different, um, something that binds them together as a new organism that does new things. And I think that art has always been um, augmented by translation. It's Chaucer listening to um, writing at a time when, when in Old English um, people are writing in tetrameter and he's listening to French hendecasyllables and he begins um, hearing a new way of presenting English and begins writing in pentameter. Um, Shakespeare was um, influenced very much by translations of Ovid, by other translations. I think that a language dies when it, um, it isn't taking in um, other languages and changing because language, like art, has to keep flowing into new forms. I have a bunch of other questions for you, Forrest, but I'm going to take one that's come in from one of our online uh, viewers. What is the importance of silence in your poetry? That's great. Um, I think, uh, especially in this time, in the 21st century, um, people are very afraid of silence. And I think that's um, part of the reason why some people are afraid of poetry, that they don't know what to do with this white space and, um, and the quiet that an attentive reading can demand. Um, because again, we're bombarded by things. But I think that people are, keep finding that they need to get to that place um, that is silent, where they can hear beyond the buzz all around them to something interior. Um, and that, that's when we get our anchor down in the deep mud of the soul. Um, and that, that counts. That's, um, that's uh, what helps transform us and, um, and allows us to, to be vulnerable and to open up, which I think is a necessary stance in the world, that we live with so much armor protecting who we are and what we feel, that to be made vulnerable, which we're made in silence, um, is um, that silence is a necessary step to accepting vulnerability, which is what opens us to what we're not expecting. I, I want to take you on a journey that might suggest the opposite of taking off your armor. I was just thinking about how, uh, I'm going to call it just provisionally the eco-poetic turn. Uh, and you gave a wonderful account of it for us. But I was just thinking back to a time when you embarked on this journey, thinking through your particular position over against uh, what we know to be a tremendously present American tradition of the wilderness, which has traditionally been seen as a tabula rasa, not counting all the great genocides and extinctions and so on. But what was it like, again, a biographical question, to stake out this kind of ground and I'm using a wilderness-type metaphor here, uh, over against that tradition. One, the presence of the wilderness in American letters and the visual arts, but also a certain kind of well-behaved, transcendentalist kind of understanding of the re human relationship to nature. Uh -huh. It's really interesting the way that wilderness is treated in different cultures and how it's changed in uh, Western English culture. In, interestingly, in Spanish, if you translate wilderness, you end up with words that are very negative, um, salvaje, or uh, paramo, or desierto, or yermo. Um, 
and, uh, and it's associated with a kind of wasteland where, the, where the humans have not touched this and so there's something horrible about it, empty, against silent. Um, and then that changed in, um, with the transcendentalist and, um, and it became more romanticized. I'm trying to, um, to not romanticize wilderness but to stake out human identity as connected to it, as, um, as not independent from, um, from places that we haven't touched because genetically we're involved in, in those just as much. There's you know, a great deal of DNA in common between a redwood tree and a human being. Um, so, and this thing that came to be called eco-poetry is really fascinating because <clears throat> you're very familiar with uh, art movements. If, if we think of um, almost any art movement or, or manifesto or literary movement, it's usually started in one city, often Paris, right, <clears throat> um, by a group of men. Uh, but this eco-poetry, which begins to take place in uh, the beginning of the 21st century, um, came up at once all over the world um, and from the very beginning some of the leading uh, writers of it were women. Uh, people like uh, um, uh, Inger Christensen in Denmark, Coral Bracho in, in Mexico, Julia Fyodorchuk in Poland, um, uh, Matt Solderland in Sweden. Um, all around the world it happened at once this sort of response uh, to what is an ecological crisis, the crisis of our time. Um, and that makes it a, a kind of singular um, movement. Because this is something we've actually discussed through the, uh, Ravi and I have discussed it in several of our contributors, this sense of how, how we perceive the climate catastrophe is also strongly linked to our conditioning, our social location, our particular politics. So right here in this library, we've had some confrontations, genteel confrontations between people who simply couldn't understand, for instance, why a Dalit former untouchable would have a completely different relationship to uh, the sacred nature of the river because to such a person, it's off limits. There's no access to it. And why we cannot have a kind of a universal sense of these questions, which tends to be top down. So I don't know if you have in, because you've also been involved as in, through translation, through vast readings of all of these colleagues, do you have a sense that there are, there's a kind of a, a set of contending positions within the larger uh, corpus of eco-poetry? I, I'm not sure if contending so much as um, as uh, as collaborating, um, but I think that uh, I th I think that <clears throat> it takes the kind of listening to others again a sort of vulnerable stance um, for us to hear something new, and that as you say we all form our habits of perception and conception. And, um, and often um, it, people in cities get their information from the same sources and have a very different idea about things than people working on a river. Um, and that we need to listen to each other. And that, that is what has to happen before people will know feelingly um, what we're being told by scientists intellectually. Which segues into the next question I had for you, which is your particular artisanal choices of how you use uh, very different kinds of vocabularies and bring them into the space and the body of the poem. Uh, given your own particular journey, that's, it's clear where that's coming from. But, in what way has that been a provocation for readers? For instance, you know, some of your poems, for instance, demand a certain kind of uh, engagement with hard science, for lack of another description. 
Though I'm not sure it demands that. As um, I'm interested, like Malcolm X said, by any means necessary. And I'm, I, I think the different kinds of language, scientific language, economic language, um, emotional language, psychological language, can, um, it is all um, fantastic material for making poetry. Um, and th th tell me the rest of your question. I As you were speaking, it suddenly occurred to me that that's the kind of thing Ezra Pound was doing, for instance. So in a way, and we were just talking about Pound a little while ago. So now the question was, what, have you faced uh, oh, right, the, the effects of this? That. On, yeah, the reader, uh, kind of a response from readers. So it's seen as a provocation. So the natural problem is some readers will say, I don't understand this word, and um, I had to look up all these words to get to the poems. No one wants to read a poem where they're having to look up all the words. But I don't think that's necessary. I think the word has a texture and a sound and is part of a rhythmic phrase, all of which have meanings. Textures of sounds have meanings, rhythms have meanings, and that as Keats says, we don't have to have that grasping after understanding everything intellectually every step of the way. Just as when we look at a painting, um, we, you know, in a Norman Rockwell painting, we see everything, we understand everything right away. Um, but um, in a painting of important art, or, or any kind of important art, our confrontation what is it that um, that artist says, I'll think of his name in a second, who says, um, when you see bad art, you think, wow, huh? And when you see great art, it's, huh? Wow. And that huh moment is the moment of not understanding right away, but it has a, a, a greater resonance, a depth, and I think, um, I think that should happen in art, that what art can do is take us out of what we're most familiar with and the habits of perception so that we expand that. Um, but it, at first, it's a, it's a risk. It also strikes me that there's, along with this wonderment... Um, Ed Russia, that's the artist. Which reminds me of our friend Meli Gobai, who was uh, an abstractionist who lived between New York and here. And he would say, does this work of art uh, make you go, aha, or does it make you go, so what? <laughs> so it, this is intriguing. But to that aha moment of aesthetic wonderment or an expansion of consciousness, I wonder if there's always been also a certain kind of politics. I mean, you alluded to that a little when you spoke of immigration as a, as a key urgency and question. Um, I'm wondering if I can draw you out on that. Now, this is, I'm sort of imposing a template, and I, that's just really a device. You've translated from languages that uh, make a certain claim on what is more or less an Anglophone American public sphere. And it's bringing in the strange, the unfamiliar, the at hand, but disregarded. How much of that was a choice and, and how much of that was happenstance and the love of the work? Well, what is happenstance anyway? <laughs> I, um, we sort of follow the inclinations that draw us out and that's what I've done in my um, in the people that I've come to translate, a visionary a Bolivian poet like Jaime Saenz, or um, a poet who lives uh, apart from people in the desert and knows the names of all the rocks and the lizards doing push-ups on them, um, Alfonso de Quino in Mexico. Um, but it's, I have wanted to add difference um, and to be alert to um, what's going on in other places that um, are, would be generative and don't just repeat something that's going on in, in my own country's work. 
And it seems as though there's always been an affinity you've had to figures like, say, Gary Snyder. Uh, for some reason, the term third mind pops up in my mind. This notion of uh, artists and writers, uh, travelers who were very open to this osmotic, porous border between cultures. And that's always been very much your sort of preferred location. Could I draw you out on that? Yes, and Gary Snyder is very important to me and might be considered one of the really um, predecessors of eco-poetry. Um, Ashwini and I went and visited him just before the pandemic broke out. He's, um, how old is he, Ashwini? He's, yeah, 92. And, uh, and he's still just as sharp as he can be. He lives in a house that he built himself um, and um, s walked with him up into this little uh, Buddhist uh, um, community where um, he speaks Japanese to his, um, some of the Japanese people there. He's, he's been someone who's been very important to me and to uh, international literature. He's revered in, in China and Japan. So we're going to bring that round to your recent engagements, with, relatively recent engagements with uh, Sangam Poetics. Because also, as we've talked about this before, it's also crucial to the recent work that Ravi Agarwal here has been doing as an artist, you as a poet. Um, again, for some reason, I'm preoccupied today with the figure of who receives aesthetic experience. This is uh, something I've been thinking about because many of us tend to bring in these things from elsewhere and we expand the ground of what is available to a reader or a viewer. And that, at one level, is a kind of an old-style avant-garde position. A, what? a sort of old, old, old sort of avant-garde position where you create a rupture and then expect that the audience will leap over it in some ways. But that doesn't strike me as being your kind of position. You, you don't arrive with a sort of adversarial or confrontational position. So what kind of gesture is that? I think it's the same gesture um, that, as the translator's gesture, that you, instead of going in and dominating a text and, and stuffing that language into the stiff shoe of your own language, you go humbly. You, you sublimate yourself, you go listening, as Ravi has done with these communities of fisher people, um, that, um, that, that spiritual activity is central to, um, to an artistic activity, it's an artistic life as far as I'm concerned. I'm just wondering if anyone here has questions. Do you have a mic that can travel to you? Yeah. Uh, I was uh, struck with your uh, use of the like, uh, lichen and the transformation, and I, I kept thinking of the word of becoming with, becoming, be, be, becoming with, not not becoming each other, but becoming with, and what that means, and I think. Uh, a lot of what you said spoke to me about that. A lot of the other poetry poems as well about the not not becoming not the each other, but to transform, but still be yourself in a sense. And somehow I always think of what that what that ethics of transformation transformation or what those postures of transformation might mean to your own self, to one's own self, and what would it take to do that transformation? It's just a thought which kept occurring to me when you brought in both the Sangam poetry and the uh, relating it to the Californian landscape uh, in terms of... Well, why don't you talk about how yeah. that's happened with, with you since it's been a, a similar experience. When I came to, um, uh, to Mumbai, I ended up in a taxi with Ravi and he started talking about Sangam and his trajectory and even vocabulary 
was so resonant with my own that I knew we would be friends for a long time. No, I, I'm uh, amazed when you talk about this idea of the uh, eco-poetics having arisen at the same time and this, uh, this move towards listening to po poetry, uh, which seems to be come true, I think, from my own experience, though we've never met before this moment, that uh, why does this appear to us as a way of being in this moment and it's a kind of exhaustion with everything else that leads you to the silences and other ways of being with yourself and being of seeing what's the way ahead of, uh, of um, uh, in, in, as you said, nourishing yourself and, and so I think uh, this is part of that, that whole, you know, what Timothy Morton calls the hyper-object yeah. of despair, which you mentioned about the war and the pandemic. Barely after the pandemic is not even over, we have this world-changing event. So this constant state of crises, we seem to be inflicting ourselves with, uh, shows that something else uh, is missing or needs to be rediscovered and that's where the, the idea of the Sangam, uh, when I was led to this poetry, it, it resonated with me of exactly what the reason, the reason you sort of got attracted to it was the relational self, relational interior self uh, to the landscape, which is so different from many other romantic poets or the later ways in which poetry becomes uh, in part, of, part of the vocabulary and what we grew up listening and, and learning from. Uh, but these are such old ideas, they are 2,000 years old. Yeah, that's so, uh, you know, the question is that, uh, have we sort of, the trajectory needs to be recovered in some ways for survival. And the survival is not only external, it's also internal survival. But the other thing we, we talked about was what you as a geologist, as a trained geologist, and now, uh, and also a poet was this idea of how science of, of informs our better awareness. Uh, new biogenetics tells us about the microbes and the, uh, and the other uh, organisms which are part of, and you know, the next person speaking is Pranay Lal who speaks about the issue of the virus, how viruses are critical to the way our placenta works in a sense. And there are innumerable new examples of that, that evolution has not never been something of of, of, a, of, a, of a, a pyramid structure, but it is, it is a flat co-evolution. And just this awareness, which we can say that science tells us when it asks these questions, or when it has a resolution to see that these answers in, in scientific terms, something should change in the way we look at the world, in a sense. It's how the knowledge of radiation changed, changed the way about what we thought about nuclear energy because we know what it did to us. So science has a big role uh, to play in our immaterial understandings and relationships, I feel. That's why I feel hopeful and why I think you also feel hopeful that there is an opportunity f for us and the possibility of reimagining our relationship to that otherness. Yes. Um, there's a beautiful line by a poet um, I love, named George Oppen, an American poet, he says, the self is no mystery. The mystery is that there's something for us to stand on. We want to be here, the act of being, the act of being more than oneself. Did you have a question? So uh, I guess I've been thinking about your use of the word, uh, the humility in listening, but also the humility in translating. And um, trained as a classicist, I have an idea of what it means to be humbled by the reception of antiquity, which actually translators have very varied interpretations of each text depending on the context in which they translated which is a very humbling thing to learn. Um, 
And I guess I'm thinking about the act of listening itself as, yes, it is hum filled with humility, but it is also an act of interpreting and imagining constantly. So it's not like it's an ego-less process. There is very much a sense of yourself in that process of listening. Um, would you agree, I guess? And is there a way to tease that out? Yeah, uh, I think that it's not the ego, though, that the ego disappears and the self becomes this sharpened attentiveness. And that's what I think is what you're talking about, that you're, you're not passively just sponging something up, but you, um, you focused all of your talent, everything that you've learned, into an attentiveness um, that isn't domineering. Right, it isn't domineering in the context where you're living, but as you go through time and you look back at those texts, there is a sense of the culture dominating over you, in fact, as a translator, um, your context. Um, so I'm just, it's kind of interesting, it's an interplay. Um, anyway, those are just thoughts. So Niha is one of the artists here who also has a background in classics and, uh, and translation. I think this is just a little bit of a comment, but um, I was very um, delighted to hear about the Sangam poets and just the connection between the pre-reflective moment and the deep ecological unconscious. And that's generally a very <clears throat> difficult thing to express, you know, because it goes into the ineffable and, you know, how do you vocalize your sensate experience? And I was just interested in terms of how you drawing inspiration from the Sangam poets um, were able to sort of vocalize your own experiences in the natural world and just the fact that, you know, the human being is an environmental interaction and, you know, yeah. yeah. Like to get out of that subject-object dichotomy. Right, right. That's the thing that I found so um, useful to me is that um, they, uh, I mean, of course we're talking about a literature that's over 2,000 years old, and so there's a lot of different theories about it. But one of the theories is that it was considered really unethical to be able to write about self without writing about what was involved in the self around you. And that's so radical. And as Ravi said, how, where did that get lost um, in, um, in a lot of the totalities of religion sometimes? Uh, but um, it's a really useful uh, thing to re-engage right now. I mean, ecology, or this ecological crisis is also connected to, to everything, to racism. It's, it's, it's the poor people of the world, the people of color who will suffer first and greatest because of this. Um, it is the overwhelming crisis of our time. And to, to, not, to look away from it um, is to look away from the major thing that's happening in, in our lives. Thank you so much. First, I just want to thank you in conclusion for both sharing your poetry, but also this larger matrix of, of ideas from which it comes, and for leaving us with these open ethical questions and how do we connect our preoccupations as makers, as creators, as people preoccupied with poetics, and what mandates we serve as citizens, as people caught up with questions of community and solidarity. And thank you also for emphasizing these transformative possibilities of listening, of humility, of unselving in a certain way, and um, really embedding 
what otherwise can be part of an expert culture in the larger and problematic everyday. It's such a pleasure to be with you, with a poet I so admire. And, um, maybe we should end with Goethe. Um, there's a little Goethe quote from Faust that also connects to our echo poetics. Das ist deine Welt, das hein eine Welt. <laughs> Thank you, Goethe. Thank you, all of you, for coming. Thank you. <laughs>